Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to start out by talking about the concept of a glass cannon. While the origin of the term isn't really 100% known, it seems to originate from the tabletop game Dungeons & Dragons to describe a general character archetype. When something is called a glass cannon, it is usually characterized by having a high damage output but low defense. So basically, it's something that is really, really strong, but really, really fragile. So, you know, a literal cannon made out of glass. When it comes to weapons for war, a weapon in the glass cannon archetype is very undesirable. You generally want things like good weapon reliability, ease of use, durability, and overall ease of production. You don't want something that takes up a lot of time and resources to make, and while strong, breaks down or fails rather quickly. If something like this does end up getting made, it usually doesn't stick around for very long. So, with today's subject, we see a wartime glass cannon, a tank that was made in very limited numbers. A tank that was rather quickly superseded by something more reliable, even though, reportedly, it had quite the impressive combat record. This tank is the Panzer Jaeger Tiger, also known as the Ferdinand and later as the Elephant. The Elephant, as I prefer to call it, began its career in a design contest for a new German heavy tank in 1941. After the early stages of Operation Barbarossa in the Soviet Union showed that German tanks often lacked adequate firepower when compared to Soviet medium and heavy tanks. Ferdinand Porsche of Porsche, and yes, it's that Porsche, submitted a design and began production on about 100 or so tank chassis. Unfortunately for Porsche, however, a different design from Henschel & Son would be selected for production instead, in part because of the drive and engine that Porsche decided to use, which we'll get into a little bit more later, so Porsche would end up having about 100 tank chassis that he wasn't really doing anything with. While Henschel's design would later become the Tiger I tank, it was decided that Porsche's design should be reworked, and by early 1943, it would begin production as a heavy tank destroyer. For this role, it would be given the brand new 88mm Pac-43 anti-tank gun. Now, as you can see from Porsche's original design and what the final product was, the biggest change from the initial proposal was that the turret was now situated at the very rear of the tank, as opposed to right at the front. This design, with the turret section at the very front or very back, was likely done to help balance the weight in conjunction with where the engine was. In the tank's final design, it would have a rather odd internal layout that would make it stand out when compared to most tanks in the war. It was operated by two distinct and separate crews. There was one crew of two located at the very front of the tank. They were the driver and radio operator. The rest of the crew, usually a group of four, was located in the large rear turret, or casemate in this case, as the turret section was fixed and could not move, and they operated the 88mm gun. These two crews were completely separated and had to rely on radio communication to coordinate movement and attacks. Located in the center between the two crews was the system of engines that would power the elephant. Initially designed with two electric engines, these would be swapped out with two Maybach HL120 TRM gas-powered engines. These engines would power two generators, which in turn powered two Siemens-type 1495A DC electric motors. Each one of these motors would power one side of the tank. While using this hybrid gas electric system would make it easier to reposition the engines to wherever they wanted inside the tank, it also meant that the Elephant would need much more maintenance and general upkeep, as the system was much less durable than more standard mechanical designs. Additionally, those engines would have to work very hard due to the sheer size of the Elephant. Measuring in at 26 feet 8 inches long, 11 feet 1 inch wide, and 9 feet 9 inches tall, the Elephant was pretty enormous. Compare that to something like America's classic M4 Sherman, which measured in at about 19 feet 2 inches long, 8 feet 7 inches wide, and 9 feet tall. Granted, the Sherman was a medium tank and not a heavy tank, 
but still I wanted to use it as a common point of reference, and the elephant was still huge regardless. If that wasn't enough, the elephant was equipped with some of the heaviest armor seen in World War II, with frontal armor that would max out at a staggering 200 millimeters, or 7.9 inches. In terms of sheer size, and when compared to things that actually made it to combat, there were very few tanks that could really match it. One such example was the Tiger II tank, which appeared about a year later. Because of its size and armor, the Elephant weighed 65 tons, or 143,000 pounds, about 80,000 pounds more than the M4 Sherman, and 50,000 pounds more than the M26 Pershing, an American heavy tank that would appear later on in the war. For its movement, the Elephant would utilize a rather simplistic design, with two rear drive sprockets, two front idlers, and a total of 12 steel wheels, with built-in springs to fill out the treads. The drive sprockets and the idlers were basically identical in their design, and the tread system as a whole was almost symmetrical. Additionally, the entirety of the elephant suspension was located outside the hull, and a great deal of it was tucked underneath the main body. This would give the tank more space on the inside, and would hypothetically make repairs of the suspension much easier. But in reality, this is where the elephant would start to run into problems. Before getting into that, though, let's quickly go over some of the tank's other issues. For one, the original design did not have any kind of secondary armament, meaning that when enemy vehicles or infantry were close enough, the elephant couldn't really do anything to protect itself. The men inside would be equipped with an MG-34 machine gun, but there wasn't any real way to fire this from inside the tank in any effective manner. Later changes to the tank would rectify this, and it was given an MG-34 ball turret at the front. Another issue, a much bigger issue, was that the engine's cooling system was not sufficient enough to actually cool the engine, which did lead to several cases of the engine catching fire. At least five, and likely more, of the total 91 elephant tanks that would be made would be lost from engine fires alone. While this was certainly a major issue, I think the bigger issue was that the suspension itself proved to be too weak and the elephant too heavy, which led to significant logistical issues and losses overall. For a clear example of this, we can look at the Battle of Kursk in mid-1943, the first time the elephant tanks would see combat. Before the tanks would advance, the Germans first sent in small Borgward IV remote-controlled demolition vehicles into the field to help clear out any anti-tank mines. However, these weren't perfect, nor could they clear out every mine in the field, which meant that a good number of the advancing elephant tanks would end up falling victim to mines, mines that often damaged nothing but the suspension. However, because the suspension was rather faulty to begin with, and the weight of the tank was so great, this made actually recovering it for repairs a massive undertaking, and several tank recovery vehicles were needed to remove a single elephant tank. This led to a somewhat common practice in Kursk and later battles where if the tank were immobilized through damage to the suspension, many would elect to just destroy it themselves and flee rather than even try to recover it. After the Battle of Kursk ended, as a result of a combination of tanks being just destroyed by battle, tanks being abandoned and destroyed, and tanks just randomly catching on fire, as was an issue, of the original 89 that would enter the battle, just 50 remained, and only a dozen or so could be considered combat ready. From this point until the end of the war, these 50 or so surviving elephant tanks would rotate in and out of being in repair, largely due to engine issues, suspension issues, and general maintenance, and they would slowly atrophy, losing a good deal of tanks to engine fires and the intentional destruction of immobilized tanks. Due to it being later in the war and Germany being on the back foot, the elephants would often suffer from a lack of resources in general, which significantly hampered the repair process. Still, for all these issues that it had, all these things that would bog it down, the elephant was still used whenever it was possible because when it was operable, it was incredibly deadly. A major reason why the elephant tanks stayed in action for all their issues was that their reported combat record 
was extremely impressive as far as tanks and tank destroyers go. Of course, while we can't accept the German after-action reports as 100% facts, and the numbers are most certainly inflated by a significant amount, even when accounting for that, these numbers do really stand out. At the Battle of Kursk alone, elephant tanks were claimed to have destroyed over 500 armored vehicles. And, for the war as a whole, it was claimed that for every elephant tank lost, 10 enemy armored vehicles were lost. Again, while these numbers are certainly inflated, its actual kill count, whatever that might be, would still be incredibly impressive. Plus, with its 200mm thick frontal armor, the elephant could take quite the beating. A good number of those destroyed in combat had to be defeated by enemy artillery firing in a more parabolic arc, which would hit the thinner armor at the top of the tank chassis and casemate. Otherwise, the thick armor could stand up to a multitude of enemy strikes before falling, making the elephant a very tough nut to crack. But at the end of the day, the biggest enemy of the elephant was itself. It certainly would pack a devastating punch with its 88mm cannon, which is why it was kept around so long and was constantly repaired and sent back out. But because of its weak suspension, maintenance-heavy engine, and rather alarming tendency to just light itself on fire, it struggled to stay on the battlefield. In the end, this is why only a total of 91 elephant tanks would be made from the original 100 tank chassis. A different tank destroyer called the Jagdpanther would be made shortly after the initial production run of the elephants, and while it was less armored than the elephant, and had much better mechanical reliability and mobility overall, while still packing the punch of the 88mm gun. Over 400 of the Jagdpanther would be made, and they stood as an overall improvement when compared to the Elephant. Still, while the Elephant has now gained a reputation for being incredibly unreliable overall, it was still an incredibly powerful tank in its day that was just ultimately defeated by itself. It was a real glass cannon, or more accurately, maybe it was like a really buff guy with glass joints. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and stop for today. So, thank you all for watching. Uh, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. To be honest, I kind of think the elephant looks like the crimson chin from the Fairly Odd Parents, and I love it. If somebody could make a world of tank skin for it that looks like the crimson chin, that would be absolutely wonderful. So anyway, I hope you liked the video, I hope you'll tune in for my next one, and I hope you learned something in this one. So, see ya.